the, I can start with Egil Hogna, who will also start the, 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 the first presentation, who is a, a senior vice president and head of the downstream and the YAR International, the big Norwegian chemical company, and previously, of course, uh, uh, Norsk Hydro, still one of the very big uh, players also in the region. Uh, before, the, you were the, uh, the McKinsey consultant in the 1990s, so I think you have very wide perspectives on, on, on uh, green growth and developments in the region. We have Elizabeth Salander Björklund, uh, who represents um, Sweden, uh, who is CEO of uh, Bergvik uh, Skog, uh, one of the big uh, private uh, companies owning the forestry and uh, very much uh, developing the business in the, the forestry direction, uh, and also being on several boards uh, of uh, Swedish academias. Uh, we have Pirita Mikkanen, representing Finland, who is executive vi vice president of Greenstream uh, uh, Network, uh, and uh, dealing with energy efficiency, dealing with climate change portfolio, and being also very active not only in the region, but also going, as we discussed yesterday, beyond the region and looking for opportunities to export our expertise and knowledge uh, uh, beyond the region. I think I stop here since time is limited, and uh, I am giving the floor uh, the opening, opening, opening presentation, uh, Mr. Egil Hogna, uh, on a green growth as a business opportunity. Please, the floor is yours. problem or part of the solution and we really strive and believe that we are part of the solution for uh, a green economy and a sustainable agriculture and cleaner environment. Today I'd like to talk about Let me see. it's just thinking oh, here we have it. I will talk about three topics. I will talk about agriculture, industrial production, May, uh, namely our own and other fertilizer production, and finally, solutions for cleaner transportation. Um, let's start by taking a look at number one, agriculture. Over a few decades, I'd say, uh, maybe approximately 20 years, it has been perceived to be a conflict between the climate and environment and modern intensive agriculture. However, the picture is quite nuanced, and uh, it is our clear belief that modern intensive agriculture actually goes hand in hand with the climate and the environment. That there are good ways of doing it, and there are not so good ways of doing it. And I'd like to go a bit in, in detail on that. What is shown here is the intergovernmental panel for climate change its view on greenhouse gas emissions basically now or, or the 2005 data compared to the target for 2050 and as you can see today or in 2005 agricultural emissions are actually a large part of the total greenhouse gas emissions and as such agriculture is part of the problem however we all need food and the question then is how can we most effectively produce the food which is necessary not only today but also in the future. Approximately half of the agricultural emissions are due to land use change and over the last decades more and more forest land, more and more swamp lands and other types of non-agricultural land has been converted into agricultural land because the world is consuming more food. And the big issue is that we will continue to consume even more food. And how can we do this in a sustainable way? And the Intergovernment Panel of Climate Change has concluded that actually half of the potential to achieve the emission target in 2050 will come from agriculture, or can come from agriculture, if we do things in the right way. 
And the way to do that is to produce more on the land which we have already converted into agricultural land in order to preserve the existing forests, preserve the biodiversity which is linked to the land which today is not agricultural land. After the European Union changed its policies in, in the 90s, uh, gradually uh, Europe has become a larger and larger net importer of food. And today we import uh, food equal to approximately 30 million hectares of land which is being used outside of Europe to produce food uh, mainly, uh, soy and uh, uh, rapeseed, which is being imported into Europe for, for example, animal production. And this is a big challenge and I would argue it is not a sustainable path. Unfortunately, Organic agriculture, or what we would call low productive agriculture, is not really a solution to this problem because of the low productivity. Converting more and more to organic agriculture is actually leading to a lower productivity, which will increase the need for land use change. And one uh, scientific survey on this shows that if we had kept the low productivity of agriculture from the 1960s, today's greenhouse gas emissions would be approximately five times as high as they are today. But then the key question is how can we increase the productivity in a sustainable way? And even though we produce fertilizer, we do not believe that the right solution for Europe is to increase the use of fertilizer. It is actually rather the opposite. But how can we do that? And this is one of the solutions or parts of the solutions which I'd like to show to you. And this is a technology which uh, is not really new. It is uh, established, but it is still has a large potential to improve and increase agriculture. This is a tractor mounted sensor which uses infrared light to determine how much nitrogen does the crop need to reach its agronomic optimum. This sensor is connected to uh, a fertilizer spreader at the back of the tractor which automatically adjusts the amount of fertilizer added in order to reach the agronomic optimum. And what we see is a typical farmer starting to use this technology can reduce his fertilizer consumption by approximately 10%. As we are in Riga and uh, around the Baltic Sea, uh, the Baltic Sea is a hot topic because the Baltic Sea has a problem linked to pollution and part of that pollution is linked to nutrient runoff. And what we have engaged ourselves in and which we think it's very important that uh, the countries around the Baltic Sea has a strong engagement in, with which they have, is uh, being able to do better nutrient management. We believe a key solution for the Baltic Sea is composed of three actions. It's better technology and procedures for nutrient management, which we, are, uh, which we have developed and which we are supporting the implementation of. It's the use of technology like this, the end sensor, and one other solution which I'd like to show you is uh, a product which we produce in Finland, which is a gypsum-based product, and it looks quite dusty, but it's basically gypsum uh, containing a lot of calcium, which prevents runoff of phosphates. Phosphate runoff is mainly a problem uh, coming from organic manure, and if you have this product on top of that, then you avoid uh, almost all of the runoff which can uh, come from fields when water and rain runs into uh, the Baltic Sea eventually. So we are partnering with approximately 150 EU demo farms to implement this technology and to measure the effectiveness of it. It's a, it's a gypsum product. So uh, this product is spread uh, onto the field after the utilization of, of manure and the calcium, uh, I mean basically gypsum is calcium sulfate and the calcium uh, helps uh, improve the soil structure so that the, the water is not running off together with uh, the phosphate nutrients. And this product is something which 
we have available in large amounts in Finland, so there it's uh, very cheap to distribute to the farmers and it's, uh, it's an important part of the solution. Uh, it is not so easy when you have to transport it long distances, because of course it does add some, some cost. But this is one part of, uh, of the solution which we believe uh, makes a lot of sense and it shows very good scientific uh, results. Then I'd like to move on to our own production because in a way we are both part of uh, the solution and part of the problem. We have developed a catalyst which is uh, shown here. It's a, it's a small thing but you need a few of those pellets uh, in uh, nitric acid plants which is one uh, key element of fertilizer production. And by using this catalyst we have been able to half our own carbon footprint. Because if you don't use a catalyst like this there are actually quite a bit of laughing gas emissions, N2O, from fertilizer production. And by implementing this technology, we have halved our own uh, greenhouse gas emissions. That's equivalent to approximately 10 million tons of CO2 equivalents per year. And we have also commercialized the technology so that in total 30 million tons uh, of uh, annual CO2 equivalents are being reduced as a consequence of this technology. And it has a global potential of 100 million tons. So, this is something we have spent approximately 25 million euros to develop. It does give us some revenues going forward, but as I will revert to in my conclusion, this is the kind of technologies where I think it is necessary both with a stick from uh, the government and the carrot in order to incentivize uh, the, the, the R&D necessary to create these kind of uh, solutions. Yeah, and this just shows the the, the statistics for that technology. My final topic is transportation and um, there are many different types <coughs> of emissions from transportation but one of the most harmful for human health is uh, nitrogen oxides or, or NOx emissions. Uh, we have one solution which eliminates up to 90% of these NOx emissions it started out for actually uh, power plants, it then moved on to large uh, ships and, and vessels, uh, it then moved on to diesel trucks and now it's also coming to passenger cars, uh, regular cars with uh, diesel engines. Uh, the technology is called uh, AdBlue uh, for cars and uh, if some of you have a Mercedes for example they call the technology BlueTech and what it implies is that uh, when you add a urea solution to the diesel, um, uh, if that is sprayed into the exhaust, then you reduce the NOx emissions uh, significantly. So this is one example of how a new technology actually can, in this particular case, uh, reduce emissions close to the total emissions of NOx in all of Spain, as, a, as one European example. So, what is then our, let's say, recommendation? Uh, if I then go back to the three categories, for agriculture we're a keen supporter of the European Union's uh, common agricultural policy uh, for 2013 going forward. We believe that financial support li linked to greening measures are extremely important to improve the practices. We support the introduction of nutrient management systems to improve yield quality and environmental performance. Today those kind of uh, nutrient management systems or, or types of it exist only in two European countries in actually Denmark and in the Netherlands that is linked to those two countries very high degree of animal production which is actually a big challenge in those countries but similar systems would actually help uh, nutrient management and avoid pollution all over Europe. For industry we believe that uh, it really does not make sense to export industrial production to Russia and other places. It is very important that we remember that we actually have very competitive and good industry in Europe and we need to have incentives for a greener industry but we also need to keep it in Europe, preventing carbon leakage to other places. And that is when you need both the stick and the carrot, the regulation and the incentives to develop technologies like the one I showed you with the catalyst. Finally, transportation. We believe it's much more cost efficient and much more sustainable to curb the emissions rather than to repair the damages for, uh, from the emissions later on. And again, there are solutions to this, but they need to be promoted and they need to be 
both again regulated and incentivized. Those were my points and uh, I look forward to your questions later on. By the way, if you are interested in more of the details and the scientific research behind this, I have some uh, small brochures here, both relating to our engagement in the Baltic Sea Action Plan, uh, the Catalyst and the Common Agricultural Policy. So please feel free to pick that up uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think that uh, since time is running and time is short, uh, if the, unless there are some questions of clarification, more conceptual uh, issues will probably sort of uh, leave for the end of the session. So when we come back and we can reflect on things, because I can see the time is running very quickly. Uh, so uh, please, uh, the floor is given to Elizabeth Salander Björklund, as I mentioned, CEO of Berkvik uh, Skog, the big forestry owning company from Sweden. So my background is in forestry and in forest industry. Uh, I'm a forester myself, according to education, I've been in the industry for 30 years. And um, I'm going to... Yes, please. Uh, I think I can speak like this. Is that okay? You can hear me in the back? Yeah? Okay. Mm, okay. So I, I will start with uh, actually a statement which I think is important, that the only way to abandon the fossil-based economy and move into the green bio-based economy is to use green resources, green renewable resources. And that, uh, do, to do that in a sustainable way and a wise way. Uh, and we need to stop the increase of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere radically. All know that and all agree that. And the IPCC, which you also referred to, they have many times said that the most effic effective long-term ways in which to use the forest to mitigate the increase in the atmospheric carbon dioxide is to substitute wood for fossil fuels and energy expensive materials. And please remember energy expensive materials. This is an energy expensive material. That is a carbon storage, uh, the wood up there. I think that's something to remember from my speech. <laughs> So, okay, how do we, how, how do, ah, okay, I just put that, okay, so. Um, I think that forestry uh, has a significance uh, actually in this carbon dioxide balance. And I think that this is the cycle. I mean, the trees more or less eat carbon dioxide. When they are growing carbon dioxide, the solar and the water actually create the trees and they store the carbon within the trees. The materials actually, uh, uh, from goes into the trees up there. Sorry, this didn't really function. I, I pushed this all this because it seems that it doesn't function the way it did when I left. Sorry. Uh, so the trees they eat the carbon dioxide. You produced something, and the in industry as such, the forest industry, <coughs> is actually utilizing very little energy because they are utilizing part of the trees as energy. So it's all also bioenergy utilized there. You produce products and you recycle them. That's one another important thing that you can do with this material. You can recycle it. And in the end of the life cycle, you can use it as bioenergy. Very often the discussion goes about that you should use the forest <coughs> for energy, but the good thing is first to <coughs> utilize them for products, like in buildings, or I saw even in the pen here, <laughs> you have <laughs> an environmental friendly pen. pen uh, so that's a very important. And then in the end of the life cycle, you can use them as bioenergy. So that's another important message. Um, actually, this is showing the Swedish forest. And it is possible to both increase the growth in the forest and at the same time the harvesting. You saw the first picture, the old, the old lady there having the grazing, the, the, the cattle. And that was how it looked like in Sweden 100 years ago. During the period, we have increased the standing stock like this. At the same time, we have increased the harvesting. This is the oil crisis, and this is the big storm we had in South Sweden, where you had a high, high harvesting. And that was due to the, the storm in the end and the oil crust there. So what we have done is that we have increased the carbon stock in the standing trees here. But at the same time, by increasing the harvesting, we have also increased the carbon stock in products. So when you talk about climate change, don't think about just keeping the trees standing there, but by using the trees in products, you also increase the possibility to have a bigger carbon stock, actually. Uh, well, this is a perhaps too detailed picture, but this is showing 
how uh, the Swedish balance emissions and absorption of carbon dioxide looks like. And this is how the balance from the forest. We have, during the period now, we have actually harvested more than ever, but at the same time, we have built up a stock. Every year, we have an uh, increased growth compared with the harvest. So this is just an example. And still, we know that it's possible to increase the growth even more. And that's something that's also possible in whole Europe. You can increase the growth in the forest. You can utilize fertilizer, for example, as Torben was pointing on, also in the forest. But you, by using the right type of species, tree species and seedlings, that you have the right seedling from the right place. In Sweden, we have calculated it's possible to increase the growth with about 25%. You often perhaps see something about eucalyptus plantation in southern hemisphere, and you know that the period in, in, in up here in the north, it takes like 70, 100 years for a rotation period. But for example, Bervik Skog here in Latvia, we have done some aspen plantation and some poplar uh, plantation where we see the rotation peri pe period is perhaps 20 years, and that is on very low grade agricultural land. And here Europe have another possibility to increase the resource of renewable resources and at the same time the carbon stored in trees and in future in products. So this is an example of the substitution effect. This is two houses which has been calculated, built in Växjö in Sweden. There is a whole research project around this. This is a timber frame building. And that building has absorbed 150 tons of carbon dioxide during the life cycle analysis. This is a reference building with concrete frame, and there you have a carbon uh, dioxide emission instead. People doesn't think about that. You think about energy and these things, but actually by choosing materials, you have a possibility to affect the climate change. So I don't want to... There's one thing I always like to say when I talk about uh, climate change, and actually that's this, the threats. Because you were also talking about the deforestation. That is one of the <coughs> biggest global problems we have when it comes to climate change. And that's about to stop the deforestation. And deforestation is very much about poverty. Poor people need to grow their crops. So that's how it happens, and that needs to be stopped. So that's no doubt about that. And when I talk about forest management, I talk about sustainable forest management. You should replant uh, after you have such a harvest. Uh, I think I move on because time is running. So coming to the products, the wood-based products, as I've said, has a huge potential storing carbon. In the, in the, in the global, how do you calculate, for example, this? They say that you store carbon in 30 years in a wooden frame product, but in, in the global calculations, when you meet and politicians discuss, but in reality, this has stored carbon perhaps for <laughs> 200 years. <laughs> so that's something. Uh, and there is a link between felling and products. Increased felling leads to increased products made out of sustainable, renewable materials, and that, so it's two good things. This is a possible combination, remember that, because very often people think that felling is bad, but actually it's good if you are sort of managing your forest in, the, in a good way, which of course is something you should do. It's good that, in, uh, that uh, increased use of wood has been recognized. I mean, it is climate change negotiation, it is now on the table, and it is recognized, uh, and that is a very good thing, and it's important to keep that. So, in the end, I think that uh, coming to the political level, this you always have to discuss on the global level, to stop the deforestation when it comes to climate change. That's an important issue. But the other part is really to think about the products and the substitution. How to substitute, uh, I mean, the plastic here, it's fossil fuel and it's uh, then <coughs> demanding energy. If this had been a wooden chair, it would have demanded less energy and it would have stored carbon during its life cycle. So, in the end, my message is think about these materials because that's something I haven't seen on the discussion agenda in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and it just shows once more that 
we have a lot of riches in our countries, and of course forestry is one of them, but still we have to think in comprehensive and sustainable way because sometimes we probably concentrate on some aspects of forestry. Like again, in Baltic countries, recently we very much discussed the biomass and using the biomass, but still we should keep in mind that sustainable forestry development, it's a much wider implications for the, the whole economy. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, I'm giving the floor to Pirita Mikanen, who is Executive Vice President of Greenstream Network, and already who is actively involved in exporting of expertise and knowledge, as I previously mentioned, beyond the region, especially towards China. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, but Queenstream Network, we are in uh, Finnish SME. Uh, we do have operations in, in Europe and in, in China. Uh, we have been involved in cli climate financing earlier, uh, involved in 110 projects around the world. We have currently more than 60 projects in China. We've invested in, in uh, for example, in, in uh, wind energy pro projects in China five times the amount of energy that, than there is in, in Finland, the whole Finland. And, and also, uh, in, in these climate projects that we are working on, the reduction is, is more than 50 million tons of, of CO2. So being a 45-people company in Finland, we, we made a difference in, in working in this uh, pioneering field. But then, on the other hand, uh, climate change uh, market is very much policy-driven. And so we've been moving on to energy efficiency because there are more tangible issues there. We found in a harsh way that policy-driven uh, market can plummet, as the climate market has done because of the prices sinking. Uh, but in, the, in a energy efficiency, that is the, uh, the there is the um, most cost-efficient way to also uh, decrease CO2 emissions. So. In, in industry, uh, there are tangible assets included, so kind of there is the market beyond the policy as well. Why we work in, in China? Okay, thanks. Um, there are very ambient, uh, ambitious goals for energy efficiency. Uh, we all know that China is, is utilizing a lot of fossil fuels. Uh, the, the efficiency of the fossil fuel plants, for example, in China compared to uh, European ones is one-fifth, one-quarter less. So there is a lot of work to be done only by increasing the efficiency of current plants and, and we can reduce the CO2 emissions at the same time. Uh, the the uh, prices of the energy in China are, are governed uh, by authorities, uh, but at the same time, the coal price uh, is that's that's a market price. So there is a like the the industry is very much in in um, in a um, strange situation. Uh, it's not a market based uh, uh, market there. Um, and then at the same time, in, there is a lot of uh, the energy demand is growing all the time. So the the message about China is that, that if they decide that something happens, it really happens. Uh, they've, they've given very strong uh, appetite for the industry for, for best-in-class technology. So I think we have very good opportunity, European companies and, and SMEs who are agile and, and having uh, new ideas to work there. I'll talk a little bit about the barriers there later on. Uh, but then the other thing is that they, the Chinese government is very much uh, supporting ESCO, the energy service company idea. So you, you do the investment into a plant, uh, uh, you can be a foreign company as well to do this, uh, but, but what you do is you share then the savings. So the, the actually the plant owner is not carrying a risk, but you have to, they have to be uh, ready to, to uh, share the risk. This is not the only that they have a, a political um, driver there, but they are also very much supporting the banking system to give the loans for this kind of uh, 
uh, projects, which, which for a lot of uh, SME companies that are working on the field or, or the EMC company, it's called EMC in China, but the ESCO companies working in China, there is a lot of financial <coughs> incentives. It's a bit, it, it, it wasn't like this in Europe when the ESCO was introduced in, in the directives. They didn't have financial incentives in the same way they have in, in China. So that, that's an other strong driver. We cannot, of course, we are not, cannot work in banking in, in China, but the Chinese banks are very interested in working with any EMC company to, to uh, go ahead with the idea. So, and then I'm coming a little bit to the barriers of, of SMEs working in, in China. Uh, Chinese um, market is unique, um, and for Finnish SMEs or, or like let's say, uh, this region uh, SMEs, uh, we are tiny. Even medium-sized, even some large-sized companies in in uh, Europe are tiny in China. In, in China. Uh, and so, what we are working on, we are working on a business model, model to kind of grow these SME companies into larger um, clusters to work in China. But then at the same time, the market in China is different. The, the buying in China, even though they are buying a turnkey solution in China, they actually, they, they ask you to provide a turnkey solution. So we go with the cluster there. We have a good solution for them. And then they said, well, this and this and this I can buy from China and these parts and I can, um, my, my cousin can, sorry, this is, but, but kind of a, they, they break it up your consortium, uh, but you have to be agile to, to to offer the ones that, that they are willing to have in the solution. And this is what we are working on. And this is our risk also that we are at the same time a little bit educating the Chinese market to buy larger turnkey solutions, which the China market is not ready to buy yet. So kind of a, uh, this is very bold to do this, to kind of think that you can uh, teach Chinese market, but, but on the other hand, they are really, there. there's a hunger for a good solution. So we did think that there is a business opportunity. Currently we are working with Finnish companies, but there is no limitation to work with other companies from the area as well. Um, and I have to say that my yesterday morning was beautiful because in my email there was a mail waiting that we signed the first uh, contract in, in China. So. So we are actually succeeding with the, the model as well. So our solution is that we have a, we have, there are some names uh, mentioned here. We have, we have a group of uh, companies. A lot of them are uh, technology providers. But when, then we have, for example, Motiva, which is an, uh, it, it's a former governmental based uh, company have been working since 80s in energy efficiency issues in, in Finland, educating the Finnish. I remember in school we had these uh, energy efficiency uh, lectures, but currently they're working on uh, industrial audits. So what we do is we often go with one solution to a plant, uh, and then we offer them the audit to find other cost-effective solutions as well. There are different kind of transactions. Uh, uh, why we are having these different ways the fact that uh, they are in different kind of um, policy schemes in, in China. So we are just, so we can match the financing and the financial incentives in China. That's why we have them in different baskets. But as you can see, these are not small parties in, in China. But we are working, we, we have to work with all. We have to find out whether there are financial incentives, whether there are some barriers that we, we will find. And none of the individual companies have enough uh, resources to find out it for, for different industries. And this is what, we are, what we're, our uh, project is about. And in the beginning I mentioned Team Finland. And this is one of the parts that makes this possible. Currently we have in Finland, it's a uh, Prime Minister's um, um, uh, initiative. Uh, it's a hubs of Finnish actors around the world in, in more than 70 hubs who are bringing uh, these country knowledge uh, to, to also to SME companies for, for, and they also give the networks in use. So we can really find out things from, from the different ministry, ministries, from trade associations, from the academia, uh, and the whole the Chinese system is, is wonderful. It always surprises you 
uh, but but this here we try to find uh, as much information as possible. Uh, try to also work on on the kind of prestige <coughs> level uh, to have the connections with different kind of ministries, NDRC and, and so forth. And then we, we actually get financing also partly from the TECES, the Technology Agency of Finland. Uh, and then for the project themselves, we have this Finvera uh, way of, of uh, supporting export projects. Then we come to, our, to my recommendations. And when I, when I was writing them, I kind of wasn't right, quite sure where I'm coming to. But I'll, these are going into details, but I have a couple of, of recommendations that are kind of uh, more higher level. First of all, uh, this, what, what, the field where we are working on, as I said in the beginning, uh, the policy, only policy-driven market is really risky. So in, now we have the, uh, the energy efficiency directive also in, in Europe in place. Uh, and these uh, investments that are related to these, uh, they, the, the policies need to be long-term term enough uh, in order to, to give us an, a steady market where we can go to. Well, these are kind of, I'm looking world from the SME eyes. So working capital is always a, a one of the issues. And so when there are these uh, policy schemes, um, you probably always hear that, that, that uh, they, they kind of the, somehow the money or the, the funding should be a bit ahead. I'm not asking for kind of saying that there needs to be more money, but I'm saying that the, the way that it's distributed or, or the scheduling of payments should be different. Um, then, what else do I have there? Well, the other one is uh, the fact that um, I, I th China is a wonderful place to work as a company because policy actions, they really take place. The time spans for 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 putting different kind of uh, policies in action is actually surprisingly short compared to the uh, size of the country, and and if you read something from the five-year plan, you know that there's going to be market because those are the goals that that will happen. Somehow it is elaborated to 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 what's happening there, and this I, I think in in. Um, Kind of different kind of democracies uh, is the time spans can be longer. That the incentives are not um, as as um, strong as in in, in China. Um, then, then of course, one of the question is that, um, as I said earlier, also about the the tiny size of the companies, the semi companies in this area, or even in in Europe. Uh, I think we have a lot to f offer to China. The the thing is, how how can we um, how can we enter Chinese market? How can we combine the fact that there's a lot of good solutions in Europe uh, and then the way of doing business is, is based very much on networks in China? How can we combine these and, and make, uh, make good business? Um, in, uh, and one thing that is not kind of, it's not clearly said there, uh, but one of the issues that we've been discussing in Finland also is how to bring the value back to, to Europe. Uh, the the Chinese, Chinese ruling is such that it's it's in many cases it's for especially for SME companies difficult to to kind of have any of the profit uh, brought back to Europe. How can we have the um, balance between? Um, there is a lot of uh, incentives now to 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 be invented even in China, but we would also need to at the same time uh, be ahead in 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 Europe to be able to cooperate in a way that, that there is value coming back to, to Europe as well. Um, then one, one um, issue that we always question is the, the when we have these public incentives, uh, what is the uh, risk profit <coughs> balance there? So this was my um, message and, and hope for, for an interesting discussion. Pilita, thank you, and congratulations on uh, also being successful in China yeah. and uh, also showing that expertise developed regionally can also be global and be offered globally, which is very important. Uh, we had an excellent uh, three presentations from Norwegian, Swedish, Finnish perspective. 
I would like to use this excellent opportunity and to bring in also the Danish perspective. And since we have the, the, the excellent opportunity having the prime minister here on on the board, uh, my question is how it looks from the Danish perspective. And I've been recently myself to Samso Island. <laughs> and uh, Samso Island, of course, is famous for being fossil free and very being very ambitious in this regard. But as I understand, that Denmark itself is very ambitious in this regard. That Denmark by 2050 has plans to be carbon neutral, carbon free economy. Is that renewable energy resources should um, be almost like 100 percent of the whole energy uh, composition? Is it realistic? <laughs> and what government is doing in that direction, what probably should still be done in that direction in the, in the, in the near and also longer future? Yeah. Please, please. Thank you, first of all, for the... For the some, some questions I want to ask you uh, as well. It is true that we are very ambitious. Uh, last year, this time, we adopted a, a very ambitious energy uh, plan uh, perhaps most uh, ambitious in the world, uh, and our uh, aim is that um, we want Denmark's entire energy supply to be covered by renewable energy by 2050. Uh, it is the, the plan is that it has different stepping stones towards 2050, and uh, uh, one of the stepping stepping stones is that half the electricity uh, consumption is to be supplied by wind already in 2020, which is not that long uh, from here. So half the en energy supply should be apply, uh, coming from, from wind. Uh, we feel that the, the, the path we are on is not something that my government has invented. It's something that was started uh, years uh, back. And uh, the result is quite, is quite clear. If you look at our, <coughs> if you look at our results, uh, we, we can see that the Danish economy over the last 30 years has been allowed uh, to, to grow uh, by almost 80%. That's how it is for a lot of our economies. Uh, but also, um, while our use of energy has remained largely the same. And I think this is what you need to aim for, a growing economy, all of us want that, but the use of energy should be uh, largely uh, the same. And also, uh, we have actually, uh, our uh, CO2 emissions have been reduced. Uh, there's a lot of explanation uh, for that, but I think the key words behind the success is a strong political commitment to this. Of course, also strong <coughs> companies that are able to uh, in, uh, invest and um, have the uh, intellectual uh, uh, capacity to renew themselves all the time. And this is one of the questions I want to come, come back to. But it is a strong political commitment long-term reliable framework conditions that moves us in, in that uh, direction, um, market-based regulation leading to <coughs> private investment and uh, integration um, of green benefits in production and con uh, consumption uh, decisions. So what I'm saying by that is that you can't move towards uh, these ambitious goals that s some of the countries share without having uh, a strong regulation, but also uh, using market-based mechanisms to, to move in that direction. And that's why the um, introductions we have here I find extremely interesting. And my, my question is, um, uh, particularly, uh, I, was, I was very interested in the agricultural um, expose, and I would be interested to, to know what are, what are actually the regulation that you need to move in that direction. And I want to be uh, quite frank with you. In my country, as perhaps in other countries, there has been that debate between a social democratic government discussing with agriculture, uh, not always, uh, not, not traditional allies. What is the ally, uh, uh, alliance you can make with agriculture if you want to have a sustainable uh, agriculture? Uh, what kind of regulation uh, do you need? Um, and have you succeeded in, in Norway doing that alliance? Um, which is to the benefit of, of everyone. I agree with what is being said here about how we need to produce our own food, food products, how we need to keep uh, the business here, how we need to make sure that we are uh, efficient in our agriculture. But it, it takes a political alliance as well, and a long-term one. And this is what I'm interested in, what kind of regulation, what kind of a, a alliance would it, would it take to, to, go, uh, to, to go in that path? Because you're absolutely right in saying, for a long time we have said, oh, we need an, um, uh, we need an echo 
uh, a biological um, agriculture, but you're actually saying it's not the most efficient way. Of course it's not, uh, and it's not the right path. And it would be interesting to hear your, your comments on that. Yes. Thank you, Prime Minister. And probably before I bring in uh, Egil, uh, please also the ambassador of Norway, so you can sort of make a team as well and uh, providing more official position and then also the, the providing your, your perspective. Please, please, Ambassador. Thank you very much. First, thank you to all the three presenters for a very interesting presentation. And uh, I'm a diplomat, not a politician, and I have to be more cautious. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would also ask Helle Thorning Smith to like to like you to elaborate a little bit further on the role of the ecological uh, agriculture, the advantages and disadvantages. Um, when it comes to the second presentation, um, uh, because of the importance of storing uh, carbon, Norway has introduced a climate and forest initiative to give countries uh, with rainforest uh, economy incentives to uh, preserve this valuable resource that generates global environment services. And a side effect of this incentive is that it is um, also uh, an alternative so source of info income f to the people who, has, who depends on the rainforest. So this has been uh, highly prioritized in, uh, in, in Norway. Um, So I think that uh, it's not much to say except for that, that Norway chair all the ambitious, goal, ambitious goals already mentioned by the Danish Prime Minister. And um, uh, that's in general we may say that the public sector's main role is to help consumers and producers take well-informed and wise choices and to promote green policy actions, environmental concerns have to be integrated into economic uh, decisions of private and public actors. Uh, when prices reflect environmental costs, there are appropriate incentives for changing behavior and for investment in green technologies. And pricing of environmental costs is also in line with the pollute-to-pay principles. Principle: The use of non-market instruments such as regulation and active technology support and innovation policies are also elements of successful green growth policies. So, uh, not to take too much time, I stop there, Mrs. Pruls. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. Egil, please. Can I just have one more question? For Probably Egil will answer, not in the Norwegian perspective, and then we come back to you and we can continue the discussion. Okay, I'll just ask anyway. Um, <laughs> 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 I think it's interesting what you were saying as well about the forestry. And I, I want to ask the same question to you. What regulation do you need in terms of planning? And, and what, what kind of regulation are you suggesting? I mean, we are <coughs> a number of different uh, countries together here. And what kind of the next uh, regulation would, would be needed um, to, to make a reality of the ideas that you are talking about? Thank you. <laughs> it's difficult to moderate politicians. Thank <laughs> 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 you, please. <laughs> Regulation is not easy. I, I think uh, we all have a lot of sympathy for the challenge associated with that because you, you say what's the kind of alliance you can create in agriculture for a regulation which would actually you know, be reasonably accepted and which would work in practice. And um, uh, of course no farmer would appreciate regulation really. I mean you will always get resistance uh, to that. We've seen that in Denmark, we've seen that in all countries which have implemented similar systems, that there is resistance to this because fundamentally fertilizer is relatively cheap compared to the benefits of it in terms of the value of the agricultural produce being, being produced. So there is a tendency to want to apply a bit more than what is agronomically optimal. And the kind of regulation which we believe to be appropriate is to make sure that you based on the type of crop which is grown, uh, have a, a regulatory framework saying that you are allowed and you should apply what uh, will take you to the agronomic optimum, but you have to document that you are not applying more than that amount. That's what we call nutrient uh, management, which we believe to be very important. In addition to that, I, I think most countries have a challenge when it comes to the 
distance food travels. It makes a lot of sense to produce what you eat close to where we actually consume it instead of transporting it around the world. And I think here all of the European countries have various challenges. And in the case of, of, of Denmark, for example, I think the number of, for example, uh, pigs uh, being produced in Denmark is a structural challenge. Uh, you should rather convert part of the agriculture to, to, to producing ex uh, what you consume. Of course, here you have the balance between economic efficiency, economies of scale, and the, the pollution and runoff problems associated with it. But uh, I, I think. Telling that to the Danish farmers. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know, and of course, I cannot sit here and represent everyone in agriculture. But uh, we, we see what we see, and you know, when, when we also work with the Baltic Sea Action Plan, we, we know that a very important cause of the runoff is organic manure. Mm -hmm. It's due to too much animal production close to the, uh, close to the sea, because it's much easier to regulate uh, runoff coming from the application of mineral fertilizer compared to all of the gylle and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. which is coming from, uh, from, from the pig production. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah, that's my short answer to that. And I, I did get a, a second question from the Norwegian ambassador, uh, if you'd like yeah, to answer sure. that now. And, and those are the advantages and disadvantages of or organic agriculture. Uh, organic agriculture has uh, promoted a number of practices that are very good and very important. One is linked to animal welfare, for example, which has greatly improved based on uh, the recommendations coming out of organic agriculture. Another one is the use of more types of different crops, the planting of trees uh, close to fields and, and so on, which increases the, uh, let's say, biodiversity of a field, which also I improves the nutrient uptake of, of the crops. Those are important benefits uh, and good practices that have been uh, promoted by organic agriculture. Uh, the, the main disadvantage of organic agriculture, which uh, I, I mentioned, is the lower productivity. Uh, there's plenty of research showing that organic agriculture has somewhere between 35 and 80 percent lower productivity. Of course it depends on how you do it and it depends on how long distances you transport organic manure and various salts and minerals uh, to, to support the organic agriculture but that transportation again is also part of, uh, of the problem. So what, what we recommend is that use all of the organic uh, fertilizer nutrients that are available locally, apply that first and then when you have applied that use uh, an equipment like the end sensor which I showed you to measure what is missing and then you apply exactly what is missing to reach the agronomic optimum. That's the most effective and most environmentally friendly way of doing agriculture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. If, yeah, well, you were asking for regulations. First of all I would say I would ask you not to regulate that we should keep the trees standing, storing the carbon in the trees, because that's a discussion that's coming up now and then, that we should not harvest because trees are storing and capturing uh, carbon dioxide. So first of all, do not do that, because remember that if you manage the trees and recycle and do all these things, and it, we use products that actually is a carbon storage and less energy in incentive intensive than uh, some other. And very often you see regulation about the energy consumption for heat or things like that in houses when you build them. But you forget about that the materials you build a house out of, that is not regulated, the energy consumption for that material and how that affects the climate change. So that area is something to learn more about and think about, I would say. I'll give you this picture when I leave. <laughs> uh, the other, if I may say one thing more, which I hadn't time for, and that is the research. Last week I visited the Royal uh, College of, of Technology in Stockholm, and I met researchers. There is a lot of research ongoing right now, especially in the Nordic countries, about to produce totally new products out of trees. And it might be chemicals, it might be medicine, uh, uh, anti-aging cream out of spruce knots, for example, antioxidants. <laughs> and it might be a new TV screen. One of the researchers pointed on the TV and said, in 10 years, Elizabeth, we will produce the TV screens out of a tree. And that is something, if you think about climate change, how do we use renewable materials in totally new products? That's something that European Europe 
European Union actually can put research money into and develop. And also remember that for adding further processing in this type of products, that's rural areas. That creates jobs. Denmark has been tremendous good in creating jobs out of forest products uh, by adding value, producing windows, doors out of the timber that we had grown in Finland, Sweden and Norway. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think continue with that. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we have three minutes. Three minutes basically already not really for questions but for some very short remarks, some, some, some observations uh, if you would like to have. Ambassador. Well, it was actually a question because it has been a very, very short it, 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 yeah, but you can take it as, as a comment if you like. It has been a very Nordic debate and, and my question would have been uh, about the differences to our uh, Baltic friends because we are talking regional cooperation here. Um, you were talking about the Danish pigs uh, and, uh, and we have some Danish pig farmers who are not staying any longer in Denmark but actually coming here and producing pigs in the Baltic states. It's not always that they are loved and liked by the locals when they are coming. It can be something with the smell or the manure uh, or whatever. But uh, I would have liked if somebody from the Baltic side or somebody who knew about the Baltic side could tell me, are, are we having differences here? Are we having, uh, are we having some lessons where we could, uh, could learn and, uh, and support each other? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Romas Juknis. I am from Lithuania. Uh, really, I wanted to present two messages for our colleagues and politicians. Uh, because, as you mentioned, Baltic states are still, despite we had 20 years when we escaped from the Soviet Union, we are almost 10 years in the European Union, but we are still uh, rather different from our colleagues and uh, friendly countries. The main our achievements, I want to stress, when we escaped from Russia, we used three times energy efficiency was three times lower. We used three times more energy to produce the same product. Currently, we almost catch up Denmark and other countries, and only maybe 10, 15 percent more we use energy, and it's, that means that our energy, and energy efficiency in Baltic countries increased, increased 2.5 times during 20 years. It's, I think, good achievement. And uh, one of the biggest problem, the biggest reserve is left for Lithuania to use, and <coughs> I think that for Latvia and Estonia maybe in the same time, uh, to use more efficient energy is our, this terrible block houses with very bad thermal behavior. We, we use two times, at not m maybe even more, two times more energy to heat our houses. And if we will, would renew them, that means we use somewhere 30% for heating now. That means may we can save 15% of total energy, and we hope that we will manage to do it in the nearest future. Excellent, thank you. Who of the organizers thought just about one hour for this interesting yeah. panel? We would have developed it uh, longer, and I think we are starting to discuss very interesting things. Uh, unfortunately, I have to conclude, and to conclude very shortly, I like to repeat uh, a little bit anecdotically, but I like to repeat one of, I will not name, but one of my friendly neighbor, uh, neighbors or representatives of one of the neighboring friendly country who says that, you know, the only common thing for Estonians and Lithuanians is Latvians, not, no, not, nothing else. Uh, there is some truth in this. We are diverse. We are different. As also Ambassador asked, and as you explained, so there are structural differences, and even what Egel said about the pig sex structural, the structural problem for Denmark. So there are structural differences as well, but at the same time, I think we are really on a common grounds in understanding the importance of sustainability, energy efficiency, importance of mitig mitigating climate change and regional cooperation. In this regard, we are ambitious in, in, in all of those aspects. And I would like to sort of finish with a, what Prime Minister said, that strong political commitment and also strong business and strong companies are very important in this regard. And I, I was happy that we brought together in this panel the business perspective, the official diplomatic perspective, and also politicians who are setting the framework and making those political commitments to implement uh, uh, the decisions which are important for all of us. 
we are perceiving that it is important. I can sort of the add as a little bit of advocacy is that, of course, in 2015, we have Latvian presidency of EU, <laughs> and then we have the very important issues, uh, green energy, the regional cooperation on our agenda. So this we are planning as there is consensus in Latvia. With this, I'm stopping here. I'm thanking very much to the Prime Minister for being very active, and it was really fun to moderate uh, you as well. <laughs> and of course, the rest of the group, our experts and also participants and ambassador, of course, as well. Thank you very much, and join me last round of applause. <laughs> for, for Thank you. Thank you.